I'm just going to ask that if you have time to go through the fair this week to support the kids that we have from our church. Yeah. They're showing cattle because there's not going to be any, okay. yeah. any uh, people probably come through there. So. Yeah. It is fair, Wednesday so. night is when they show, and then they'll be there Thursday. Okay. Thursday. All right. Everybody want to go to the go to the fair, and particularly Wednesday night. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish it wasn't part. Wednesday night, but. Are we rolling? All right. So everybody, there's going to be a lot of folks going to the fair now. <laughs> Good. Because there's a lot of folks like this. We know. I was curious about Facebook and the counter on that. Because it was plays and now it's views or views and now plays. I don't know. Anyway, we're continuing our study in Psalm. We're looking at the 84th Psalm this week. In our intro here, he starts out, Charles Spurgeon called it the pearl of psalms and the most sweet of the psalms of peace. Psalm 84 is indeed a psalm of great beauty. It is a psalm of blessings and longing. It speaks of the blessings that come from being in the Lord's presence and a longing to be there. It is one of the, it is one of the pilgrimage psalms or psalms of ascent. These psalms were sung by Jewish pilgrims traveling up to Jerusalem and to the temple to celebrate one of the worship feasts. A well-known line from one of these psalms reads, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. The important message of this psalm is the benefits that come from being in the presence of the Lord. It is the Lord that makes this psalm beautiful. It is his presence that makes the people blessed. It is his presence that makes Jerusalem and the temple special. It is a psalm that applies to our worship of the Lord and the blessings of gathering in his presence. We all should have a strong desire to be in the house of God, which are churches today. Statistics tell us that church attendance is on the decline in America. And all this is that all this says is that we have disobedient people in America. There's nothing new because the writer of Hebrews said that forsaking the assembling of ourselves together was the manner of some in his day. Our desire to assemble with the church of our membership shows how much we value the Lord's presence and manifest the condition of a relationship with him. So we're going to start here looking at these 12 verses and, and studying this this week and, and looking at some different things about this, this psalm and, and different commentaries. There's three different ways that, uh, that this can be applied, this psalm, that, that I, what I was looking at. One is that the exiled Jews long to be back at the temple, which is the literal application that we're looking at here. And another one is that today it can apply to us longing to meet in our church and how we long to be there when something prevents us, when, when something's preventing it, like, like when COVID, when we had COVID. How did everybody, you know, everybody was just anxious to get back to church. It, sometimes we take being able to worship and meet here at, we take it for granted. And then once once we couldn't, um, that was not good. And then we so then we came and we assembled in the parking lot in our cars. And that was that was different. That was better. But it's still not the same. And you remember that day when you got to come back for the first time and actually meet here and worship like we were used to worshiping? That was that was something that we longed for. And that's another application that, that we're going to look at here. And then then when we get done looking at those two, I want to talk about a third application that we can use this for. But to start with the first four verses, how amiable are the tabernacles, O Lord of hosts? My soul longeth, yea, fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. And then Selah, once again, stop and pause and ponder what we were just talking about there. The opening line, it tells us here, the opening line of Psalm 84 tells us that the Lord is not confined to a single place. The term tabernacles is plural, meaning dwelling places. The Lord is omnipresent. God is everywhere. And God's special dwelling places in the Old Testament were the tabernacle and the temple. But, but here today we know that, that God
God is in our churches. And and if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And it goes on to say that the Lord is still present everywhere, but has chosen his churches to be his temples. And it's God's presence that makes any place special. And this psalmist desired to dwell where God dwells. Wherever God's at, it makes it special. It's something wonderful. It's something great. And, you know, that's why when you have a group of believers gathered in the Lord's house, it's not just because this is the Lord's house and God's present where three or more gather, but God's present because he, he as we said, he dwells within us. And it's just so nice to be around a group of like believers. And not just at church, though. Isn't it nice to work, to, to be in a workplace of people that are like-minded believers, it's it's refreshing to me to to work for a company that that they they espouse or they're not ashamed, they're not afraid to, to let people know. I mean, we play Christian music over the over the speakers uh, at all of the stores, and and, and there's nothing. That's wonderful. And I, there's been a couple of people over the past 14 and a half years that I've been there that have complained about that or complained about the commercials at Christmas time. And I always like to talk to those people that want to complain about the presence of God or want to complain about espousing the presence of God. Or, or That's like, let me tell you about it. I mean, it's just... But it's so nice to be around people that are believers. And that's at work. And isn't it nice to go to a, a football game, a high school football game in, in this area, where they're not afraid to have a student say a prayer before the ball game starts. We're not, it's because there's so many places in this country that they can't. But... He goes on, like I said, we can worship God anywhere at any time, but attendance in church worship services is both commanded and beneficial to us. <clears throat> God tells us to meet in the Lord's house, and it's not just because he wants us to meet in his house and, and lift up worship to him and, and to praise him, but because it's good for us. Anytime God tells us in his word a command or tells us something that we should do or he desires for us to do, it's not because... He's a puppet master and pulling our strings and, oh, look, I'm making them do this, I'm making them do that. Every time, it's because that's what's best for us. God, he's, he loves everyone and he desires for us to love him. And he desires for us to, to listen to him. And the instruction that he gives is not to show that he's in charge and he's the creator and he made us and he can make us do anything. It's because he wishes for us to desire to look to him and he wishes the best for us. And that's why he wants us in church and that's why he wants it because it's best for us to be, a, like I said, around like-minded individuals. It makes work better. It makes your life better. It makes church worship better it, it, it's all better for us and he just wants us to see that special times and places of worship are important in maintaining our worship of God meeting with fellow church members to worship together encourages our worship so the more you do something the more you want to do something as well the more we follow God and his will the more we want to follow God and his will in verses 5 through 8 blessed is the man whose strength is in thee in whose heart are the ways of them. As in happy or pleased is the man whose strength is in thee, whose strength is in God, and in whose heart are in the ways of them, and whose, whose desire is for this pilgrimage to Jerusalem that they're talking about, who passing through the valley of, of Baca make it well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. And Selah, again, as I said, if you just looked at the Psalms that we studied in these last few months, 
you'd think Selah appears a few thousand times in the Bible, but we're we're looking at the ones that that God really wants us to stop and ponder and think about. <clears throat> so God's people are a journeying people. The Israelites were strangers and sojourners. We're called strangers and pilgrims. The world is not our home, but like Abraham, we look for a city whose builder and maker is God. He goes on to say, even after the Israelites had settled in the promised land, the Lord required them to journey to Jerusalem for three feasts each year, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. We are not certain if this psalm was dedicated to a particular feast or if it was used in all three journeys to Jerusalem. The journeys to Jerusalem reminded the people that they would never permanently settle on earth because heaven was their eternal dwelling. And it also could apply to when they were in exile and they were longing to be back to the to the, to the journeys to Jerusalem for, and being pilgrims to the three, three feasts. Traveling is difficult today, but it was much more so in biblical times. The psalmist spoke of the strength needed for travel, and that this strength comes from the Lord. The Valley of Baca is sometimes re rendered the Valley of Weeping because the Hebrew word Baca refers to the balsam tree whose sap oozed like tree tears. It is nowhere found on the map, but instead refers to any place of difficulty. As the pilgrims journeyed to Jerusalem, they saw these weeping trees, which reminded them of the many tears they had shed in troubled times. I would, I'd like to see those trees. I mean, these balsam trees that that look like they were weeping, and that you know, just use that in the, in re, to remind the people of the tears that they've shed in traveling to see God. This journey to Jerusalem becomes a metaphor for life. How many of us have traveled through the Valley of Baca? Who has not gone through troubled times filled with weeping? But with the Lord's strength, the arid valley is turned into a well of refreshing water. The Lord can turn our weeping into an oasis pool in the desert. The Lord increases our strength through hardships and pilgrimage. He gives us grace for each step and grace for the day. Through prayer, we pass through the valley, but we do not stay there. The Lord hears our prayers and comforts our heart. Is that not true? Can we not apply that to our... Everyone can look back at a time in their life. <clears throat> these people were, were journeying back to Jerusalem for one of these three feasts for you. You know, when they're, they're asking... And it's good for them because they stop and they... They, they stop, they traveling but they can ponder they've got plenty of time to think about what God has done for them they have plenty of time to think about you know they travel they see those balsam trees and they think you know I've been there I've done that I've shed tears and yet the Lord lifted me up and he provided for me just like an oasis in the desert and each of those steps along the way instead of starting the journey so many times when you start out on a long journey, you're all people that hike the Appalachian Trail. They, if you're doing a, a through hike, the entire length of the trail, which is 2,100 miles, is that right? It starts in Georgia and it ends in May. And if you're doing a, a through hike throughout the in one year, you have to start in Georgia in very early spring, where it's just you know just starting new growth and because it takes so long on that journey. And then you end in Maine, you can't start in Maine because in early March, it's still something I mean, you could, but it'd be foolish because it's still frozen and ice and everything. And so you start that journey. And I've read, there was one guy that did a hike that was a friend of a friend. And he did a, a, a journal, a, a blog. This was 15, 16 years ago. But I read his, he, he would post updates every few days and he talked about how much he weighed when he started and how he you know got ready for this and and then how the resupply along the way and and all and but the guy lost probably 20 percent of his body weight and he was exhausted when he got to the end you know two thousand miles later and that's what it's like when if you go out if you go out and take a 10 mile hike you're a lot more tired at the end of that hike than you were at the beginning of the hike when when we go hunting and uh, last year in Colorado and we walk up and down the mountains all day, you take, you're a whole lot more tired at the end of the day than you were in the morning when you got up and rolled out of your sleeping bag. 
but you're typically <coughs> a lot more tired at the end of the journey than you were at the start of the journey. But that's what he's saying here. They go from strength to strength, every one of them is iron. God makes you stronger as you travel on these pilgrimages. On, as we go through life, as we suffer through problems, and as we look to God, and as we go through these valleys where tears are shed, and we need an oasis provided by God, and we need to get through there. When we get to the, we don't we don't stay in that valley. We move, we pass through that valley, and we're stronger once we pass through that. God grows us spiritually. He matures us as we go through our life and as we go through these problems. You'll, you'll suffer problems now that, that you could get through, that you could look back in your life and say, you know, there was a time when there was no way I could have handled this. And of course, you're not handling it anyway. God's doing it for us. He's, he's carrying us through it. But we get stronger as we travel down this path with our Savior Jesus Christ. We get stronger, not weaker. He makes us stronger. In whose heart are the ways of them? In, in verse 80, 84, 5, at the end of it, it says, In whose heart are the ways of them? It means that the pilgrims have journeyed to Jerusalem so many times that they know the way by heart. Symbolically, this refers to the faithfulness of the worshiper. Even though they knew their way to Jerusalem and the temple by heart, they still had an intense longing to go there. Even though we've studied God's Word and even though we've sung those songs many, many times, we still long to go and meet and gather and worship the Lord. It's not something that it's just one time and, okay, I'm good, that's, that's fine. These people longed to go to Jerusalem and to make this journey, this pilgrimage. They enjoyed it. And they've done it many times. But they they still wanted to travel that path. 9 through 12. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointing. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will be withheld from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. He goes on to say here that it is better to be a servant in the work of God than to be a chief among the wicked. That's one of his statements there. True worshipers of God long to attend the Lord's worship services. They are not long and boring to them. Instead, they are too brief and filled with joy. How many times have you sat through a worship service and your mind just wasn't there? You didn't, you weren't prepared when you came to church. You were too preoccupied about something else that was going on in your life that you've seen that particular day to put more importance on than worshiping God. And that service seemed like it would never be over. And then how many times did you have, were you prepared and excited because you saw God work in your life that week. You saw something firsthand that he had done. Maybe he did something for somebody. Maybe he did something for you. But you were excited to get back in God's house and to worship because you couldn't wait to go tell some of your like-minded believers, look what God did for me this week. And, and you go that day, and it starts, and it's over, and you're like, well, where did the time go? It was, it was so wonderful. It's just like you never realized it. As the center is, the, as the sun is the center to our solar system, so is the Lord to His true worshippers. Like the sun is to the earth, the Lord is the giver of light and life. With God, there is protection from all adversity along the journey, grace that enables us to continue in the journey, and glory that shall be revealed to us at the end of the journey. Our God gives us everything we need to walk uprightly and to serve Him faithfully. Three times in this psalm, we read of those who are blessed. They are blessed who dwell in the house of the Lord continually praising Him. They are blessed who find their strength in the Lord and whose hearts remain. And they are blessed who trust in the Lord. But being blessed is not about having things but having God. 
it's not <clears throat> it's not that we're blessed and oh look what we've got because we're blessed it's we're blessed and look who we have because we're blessed we have God in our lives we have Jesus Christ as our Savior what more do we need from that everything else is just gravy if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior he says in setting the application, the thing for which the psalmist of 84 longed was to be present in the temple at Jerusalem to worship God. But so many things about the temple were limited. Worshippers needed the aid of priests to, per to perform their worship duties. Women, Gentiles, and others did not have the same access to the temple as Jewish men. None but the priests had access to the holy place, and no one had access to the holy of holies but the high priest, and that being only one time a year. When Jesus was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn in two, signifying new access to the very presence of God behind the veil. Now, by the true high priest, Jesus Christ, we can come boldly to the very throne of God, the throne of his grace, that we may have mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. <clears throat> we can now enter the holiest of God's presence by the blood of Jesus Christ. We now can worship God directly with no barrier in between. How much more should we desire to approach God directly, be in His presence, and worship Him? How much better should it be for us than these pilgrims, these Jews in Israel? Their pilgrimage, they were excited to be in the, tab in, in the temple. They were excited to be in the temple and to travel there, a difficult travel, three times a year, they were so excited to be there, and all they were going to be able to do is sit in the back. They really couldn't see much of anything. And if you were a lady, you couldn't couldn't sit in the back. And if you were not a Jew, you couldn't sit in, in there either. You, could, you couldn't partake. But yet these people still wanted to be there. And we can be a part of it. That's no longer the case. Jesus, we can approach we can approach God anytime, anywhere. We don't we aren't held back by that. And that leads me to the third application of this. That we we can approach God and we, we are so thankful for that and we so long to be able to approach God and to be a part of it. The third application that you can think about this <clears throat> psalm is Thinking about being a godly pilgrim, long, homesick for heaven. Think about being a saved individual, knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we're homesick for heaven. So we go back through the verses and look at it in that manner. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies. I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. We really long to be in God's presence, not just in church with a bunch of light and foot. Do we not long for what eternity is going to be like in the presence of God, Jesus Christ our Savior, all of those that have gone on before us, all of those that we've read about and we've studied about and we've been told stories about? How wonderful is that going to be? We're a pilgrim on a trip, on a we're traveling. And that's our destination, heaven. And that's what each of us are that know Jesus as our Savior. We're on a pilgrimage. Verse 3. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself, where she places her young, near your altar, Lord of armies, my King and my God. A sparrow in the Bible is a picture of loneliness. And a swallow is relentlessly darting about. If you've ever watched a, a, a swallow, they just, here, there. They, 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 so you, you think about a pilgrim. You think about us on a pilgrimage to heaven. And you can be in a room full of people and you can still be lonely. You can have family around you. You can still be lonely. Everybody experiences times of loneliness when they think, and we think that there's 
Nothing anybody else can do. There's nobody else to help. There's nothing but uh, it's us and us alone. But if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's not so. He dwells within us, the Holy Spirit. And, and then we're also like these swallows who are just, we go about our life just here and there and everywhere. We feel, do we not just feel some days like we're not going to get it all done? We've got too much to do. There's too many things. And then you, you start stacking them up in front of you. You start trying to prioritize them. Which one should I do first? Which one's next? And, this, and, and we're just jumping around. And we're losing sight of what's really important. And then where it talks about where she finds, where she places her young near your altar is the Lord of Armies. The, the only place that they find security for themselves and their family, these birds, us, the only place that we find security for ourselves and our family is that at the Lord's altar. And that's the only place our soul will find rest is in God's presence. And then verse 4, How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. How happy are those people that have gone before us. They've gone ahead of us, and they're in Jesus' presence now. And they pray, they're praising God continually. And we can't grieve for those people. Because they are so much better off than we are. We're still on the journey. And they've completed theirs. And then verse 5. Happy are the people whose strength is in you. Whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. The world is not our home. We are in it, but we're not of it. Our heart is on this pilgrimage to heaven. Our heart desires to be in God's presence. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make a, a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. And, and they go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. We find joys in our sorrow, our weeping. I talked about that a while ago. When difficult times in our life, we can find joy in because God delivers us through it and he helps us through it. And then we're, the, the metaphor for rain here is the Holy Spirit. He's providing for us in our journey. And then also, as I mentioned, that we get stronger, not weaker, as we mature spiritually. We, we go through this and God strengthens us through the trials that we suffer in our life, through the issues that we face. And when we don't turn away from them, when we don't turn to, when we turn to God to get us through them, He strengthens us through these. And then the Holy Spirit provides for us the rain. The Holy Spirit provides for us the strength to do this. And then each appears before God in Zion. The joy we have at the end of this pilgrimage of seeing God, seeing Jesus Christ, our Savior. In verse 8, Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. <clears throat> this one was interesting in that the Lord of hosts, that's what King James says, the Lord God of the Lord of hosts, or, and this version says the Lord God of armies. Hosts meaning armies, meaning the angelic beings, meaning all the angels that are in heaven. He's the God over all of those. He's also the God of Jacob, meaning the God of us, the unworthy. You've got all of God's creation. You've got the angelic beings that are with him in heaven, and you've got all of us. Man. Man with sin nature. The God of Jacob. The unworthy. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. This is where it's really good. The only reason we can complete this pilgrimage, the only reason we can be there and look at God, the only reason that we can make it to heaven and that we will be there and, and that that's what we're homesick for and we know we can get there, the only reason, of course, is because of Jesus Christ. 
our Savior. He's the only reason. And then I saw this. It says, God sees my Savior, and then he sees me. In the beloved, accepted, and free. That's who we are. God sees us through His Son Jesus Christ. He doesn't see. He doesn't see us. He sees in the beloved that we are, and, and because of that, we're accepted and free. And then verse ten: Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. A day there in heaven is better than a thousand anywhere else. You could probably just say a day there in heaven is better than an infinite amount of days anywhere else. And it's... <clears throat> we don't know what heaven is going to be like. We can't fathom what heaven is going to be like. And one of the reasons, I believe, that we don't know what's there but and how it's going to be, we get these, we have these descriptions and God showed us a little bit. But if we truly know what that was going to be like, we just call it quits here and now. Say, <laughs> let's go. I'm, we're all done. We let it. But we are living our life according to God's will. And God's will is for us to do the work that He's got set aside for us. He's got a job for us to do. He's got things for us to do on this journey. There's folks along this journey that we have to help along their journey. But still, it's wonderful to know that a day there is better than a thousand here or anywhere else that you can imagine. For the Lord God is the sun and shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. On this pilgrimage, God will withhold nothing from you if it's good. If it's good for us, he's going to give it to us. He'll bless us with it. And if it's not good, the reverse is, it applies. If there's something that we think we need, if there's something that we desire, our heart desires, and we just can't get it, and we get to thinking, well, God's withholding that from me. There's a good reason for that. Because it's not in our best interest. If it's good for us, he'll provide it. And, and he'll assist us through our pilgrimage. And if it's not, if we're following his will, he'll withhold it. And then 12. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. We are eternally grateful to be a Christian. We are eternally grateful for what Jesus Christ did. And that's why we're homesick for heaven. And two, that's because we are so thankful for Jesus Christ and what he did for us that we want to help everyone else whose paths cross ours to let them know. Maybe they are, maybe they've accepted, maybe they know Jesus as their Savior and they just, you're there, God put you there to provide some good for them along their trip. Or maybe they have no idea where all these people are headed and what, all these, what are all these people doing. Why are they living their life like this? They act like they're going somewhere. They act like they got something to look forward to. It's just another day to some people. Some people wake up in misery because it's just another grinding day to get through and some people wake up excited. What do you have for me today? And knowing that at the end of that day, they're going to be stronger for following God's will and everything that they do. <clears throat> With that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Thankful, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. And just thankful for this 84th Psalm and pointing out our pilgrimage and pointing out our homesickness for heaven and just giving us encouragement 
to seek your will in all that we do and, and to find excitement in all those people that you place in our paths as we take this journey and all of those opportunities that we will be able to help them and to know that anytime trouble comes our way, you're right there with us and the Holy Spirit will provide the refreshing rain to strengthen us on this trip. I just pray, Lord, that we reach out into our community and all those that you place before us and that we share this excitement with everyone, with everyone that comes in contact with us. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.